WABC time 11 to 6, and uh, morning low clouds and fog will uh, give way to hazy sunshine. High near 80 today. How's that? And Maxie Cohn is with us. She is a film director. And she really proposed something which I thought was fascinating, to use this program to cast a film. Uh, she's looking for people who are angry. I put an ad in the Village Voice, and I filmed some of the people who answered that ad. Now I want to find some more angry people uh, through your show. And I think you picked the right city. New York is, of course, I think the anger capital of the world. Bosh! What is that? That's the homo yuppie quiz on the west side. <coughs> How do you do that? Oh, we just... Take that ass. Just, that's all. Or you get out to the piers and start stomping people. Or, or doing a float test. Can you swim? Go see his tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Tracks. He's got tracks yeah. all over him. Yeah. He has a chemical junk and I'm proud of it. That's a prison tattoo right there. Why than not? Worse than not. What's that mean? He did time. What did he do time for? Assault, armed robbery, order of theft, a couple other things. Would you believe I'm the only person here who probably doesn't even have a criminal record? You are. Oh, you are, man. For all you idiots out there, this one's for you. Yeah. <laughs> you guys step off. <laughs> Yuppie, step off. I wasn't alone. I was with my boyfriend at the time. And we were on this beach. It was dark. And we were just enjoying, you know, the ocean and everything. And suddenly these three guys out of nowhere jump on us beat him up, hit him with like a gun or a rock or something really hard. They had, they knocked his eye out for a really long time. He had all that blood and everything. And they tore my clothes off and they raped me. They stole all our money. It was like the most horrible, disgusting thing. And, but 10 years go by and I kind of, you know, got over it. You do get over these things. God knows how, but you do manage to get over it. But last year, last summer, this guy tried to rape me, and I had made up my mind that I was never going to be raped again. Never. No matter what. I don't care. I will fight to the death. I don't care. So this guy comes up with a knife, and he presses the knife against my neck, and he decides he wants to rape me. So I made up my mind then and there. If I was going to die, I was going to die. But I'm going to beat him off no matter what I have to do. So I screamed and screamed because I was really at a physical disadvantage, and uh, he decided he didn't want it just leave without doing some kind of damage whatsoever. So he slashed my neck over here. I got 37 stitches. It goes way behind my ear. He slashed my wrist where I tried to defend myself. I got five stitches there, 42 stitches all together. And, and then, you know, the bastard just ran away, ran away. And I remember laying in the hospital afterwards at the time thinking that all the forces in the world, all the forces of evil focus them focus them on this guy, on this human scum, you know, this thing that has to do this to me. Just focus everything onto him, funnel it in, you know, funnel it onto him. Everything you do to someone does eventually come back to you. Everything you do, all actions have reactions. And if I didn't believe that, I would have kissed the D-train a long time ago. Because I really do believe that this guy, he's dead or in jail or whatever. You know, you live in the jungle, you die in the jungle. But another thing I want to mention to you, and this is even more important than being raped and being stared by anonymous strangers, is the fact that right after I recovered from having been stared, not long after either, about a month after, my boyfriend decided to leave me. And he told me that he had wanted to leave me even at the time, even that day. What a coincidence. He says, you know, that day I was actually thinking of breaking up with you. And then I heard the news and I said, oh, well, I can't break up with her now. I got to wait till she gets a little bit better, and, you know. So I said, oh, that's nice. You know, don't kick a dog when it's down. Wait till it gets back up and then kick it. My name is Louis Eppolito. I'm a New York City detective. I've been working in the police department for 17 years. I've gotten over 175 commendations for bravery. I have two Medal of Honors, uh, two Medal of Merits, two honorable mentions, 16 Medal of Valors. On the 27th of November, my uh, partner called me up at about quarter to seven in the morning. He woke me. He said to me, have you seen the paper today? I said, no, I haven't. I went downstairs and I opened the headlines of the Daily News and said, Ma Big got data from cop. And at that time I lost my stomach. I've been in seven gun battles in the streets of New York. I stood alone when the Black Liberation Army were killing cops and I fired my gun with seven of them. There were over 44 shots fired at me. I had no fear. I've taken people out of places with cocked 
shotguns put in my mouth and told me they wanted to show me how to die like a man. And I said, if you have to pull the trigger, do it. I had no fear. I've gone into burning buildings and taken out people and had no fear. When I saw those headlines, I lost my guts. I said, this is it. My whole career shot right down the troops. They had my home watched for six months. They had me watched wherever I went for six months without my knowledge. They evaded my telephone. They had that tapped to find out who I was talking to. All these facts were made known to trial. I was found completely not guilty. This investigation killed this individual that's speaking right now. It killed me. I'm angry enough right now that if I saw something happening in the street, possibility I wouldn't do a goddamn thing about it because it's none of my fucking business. You let another guy handle it. I was never like that. I loved what I was doing. Now I wouldn't do shit. I will not go any further than, can I help you? What is this in reference to? And that's it. No more will the city of New York get from me what I gave. I'm, I murdered four people, killed them. Uh, of the four, I could only really felt that I was angry, really mad one of those times. And for whatever reason, that was the one time I, I uh, it, 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 uh, it, what really it turned out not to be justified. I came home to my apartment one time when I was living in the Lower East uh, Village and using drugs. And uh, I found some things missing. And I <clears throat> had a 38, uh, and I went upstairs to see this guy, Ozzy, who was the only one that I thought could have been responsible, and I shot him. It was just pure anger. I, just, I was just boiling mad because I wanted the drugs. And I couldn't think of anybody else, so I went upstairs and I shot Ozzy. The other three, one was a knifing in San Francisco, and the other two were a girl and a guy that uh, was selling drugs for me and a friend of mine, and they beat us uh, on a deal, and uh, we gave him a hot shot, which is a, a shot of battery acid. And I felt absolutely, you know, as far as I could tell, nothing. And so I didn't, I didn't, I was angry when I shot Ozzy, but the other three, I, I, I felt nothing. It was just, I was like the judge and the jury and the executioner all rolled into one, and I just felt that I was right and had no compunctions about doing it at all. I have uh, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, which according to my doctors is incurable. It's a, it's a, atrophy of liver tissue. Uh, according to traditional Chinese medicine, uh, liver diseases are, are associated with anger. And I would say that's corroborated to some extent by my experiences in AA, where I found a lot of angry people who were drinking to drown their anger. I went to an endocrinologist, and I found out through many of the tests that they did that I was biologically a woman and a man at the same time. When did you find out you were not a man? After I had had about five breast operations, I was intersexed. I didn't have any testicles. And the breast development was there. My body was not a male body. And I was given a choice to make. It was either that I could stay in the middle or I could uh, choose for sex reassignment. And I was angry, so angry at, at this because I, it wasn't something that I, I was able to accept at the time. After two years of constantly crying, night after night after night, and my wife being upset, and my child being upset, and the constant uh, uh, harassment from people, people on the job, I became so helpless. And finally, after seeing many doctors to try to have some way to have it corrected, it, it was an impossibility. And it was a question of being a circus for the society or choosing to be a woman. And I, I, I thought at that time that it was much 
easier for me to be a woman. And although I'm not married to my wife anymore, we still live together as sisters for the child. But it's a small 9 by 12 room for three of us. And since then, I've lost my job. I've lost everything. Street. My mother and I shared a room until I was about 10. Um, she would undress and dress in front of me when I noticed her body, the body hair and her breasts, and inquired about them. She scolded me, said I had a dirty mind. I was bewildered by this. If I'd been more discreet and just watched out of the corner of my eye or had uh, not asked about it, I might have gotten away with it. As it was, things started to go bad. It was about at that time, when I was six or seven, that I started having what I now know were sadistic fantasies. With hindsight, I know what I was fantasizing about and why I had these things. They were the, my anger, uh, what I saw as the unfairness of my mother's behavior and her treatment of me welling up and turning itself around into punishment for her. Uh, I didn't have a chance to act out my fantasies until I was in my late 30s. When I encountered a woman, we started living together, and to my surprise, she produced a coil of rope and a riding crop and asked me to tie her up and whip her. Uh, <clears throat> I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I did what she asked. By the time I was finished with her, she was whimpering and sobbing, and her bottom looked like a no man's land after a shelling. I was covered with red and purple welts with blood blisters where the welts crossed each other, and she was very happy. And she got aroused to the point of having ecstatic sex after this. And we continued that relationship for several years. I have never even thought of inflicting treatment like that on anyone who didn't ask for it. The real kicker for me is that the woman does offer herself, and she submits to it willingly. Um, well, I'm a painter. Marshall's a painter. We're both two very dedicated, strong painters. Uh, we're not successful, so at this point, um, we were holding down jobs and painting. And uh, we've been seeing each other. Well, we're not seeing each other now. We haven't been seeing each other for a year and a half, supposedly, although we're stuck in the same apartment because we both can't afford to move. We have been seeing each other for about nine years. Um, when Marshall started seeing someone else um, about a year and a half ago. And uh, up until that point, it had been in a, a pattern of, you know, abuse, physical and mental abuse. And Marshall's excuse always for this is that I play the victim, whereas... Well, you do play the victim. It you know, you, it doesn't you pretend to be the innocent victim, and then you, ju and you just don't uh, you know, you have any consideration for me. When I first started seeing Marshall, I feel like I was a different person back then. I was a really nice person back then. I was. Well, the, I kernel, feel, the kernel of the I problem feel, is that we're both stuck in the same apartment, we're both painting. No, that's not the point of the problem, have to, Marshall. We that's, both have to get apart, and we can't that afford That is not to the core out. of the problem. Right. The core of the problem is that Marshall the core of the problem is, that we is got king it. of the double standard. She had me thrown out of my own apartment with an order of protection for supposedly a slap. 
Okay, that is not that is not the kind of there are women in in, in uh, abused women shelters who are, who are who are totally abused and they get orders of protection against their husband. This was just pure malice, and I never got I never got any revenge for that. I was thrown out of my own apartment, you know, for for like two weeks, and I couldn't enter my own apartment, and she would call the police on me, and that that is just being very vengeful, you know. There was no reason to throw me out for an alleged slap. When you know that is that is not that is that is not that is, that is not that is not that is not uh, uh, grounds to throw someone out of their own apartment. And I I could have done a few because she she has threatened me to make mafia hits against me, to have me murdered, to have me killed. You know she she's got a um, her, her her uncle is in prison. He, he was he's a he's a, a gangster, and she's threatening to have me killed. You know, and this is I could have gotten her. You know, I could have gotten an order of protection of harassment against her, that she was threatening my life, yet I didn't, you know? This is the kind of right, double-sided thing may that's going now? on. Can I speak now? Can I please speak? Well, why don't you just get out of the situation, then? If you can just... I please... Can I please speak without him interrupting me? What are you asking permission for? You're always well, asking shut permission. Shut the fuck up, then! <laughs> You always got to ask permission, you know. What are you right, asking well, permission? You're so if I can't speak, then I'm stopping with you, you right here. You just like you just you just totally get dominated by authoritarian figures in your life. You know, stop being, uh, stop having authoritarian figures ruling you. This now is the, the camera is not Don't the have to ask to speak. There's no authority speak, over there. So there's no way to speak if you're going to keep yelling, and I I don't have a chance to speak. We'll just finish it right here. Go ahead, speak. Go ahead. I, want five I, may t I may totally disagree with you, but I will defend to the death your right. Oh, that's, that's right a right. new one. <laughs> you I'm never did before. I'm a Democrat. I'm Democratic. Yeah. Well, that's a change. You used to be a fascist as far as I knew. I'll talk about fascists. You're a fascist. I got Marshall a job in the restaurant. I got him a job as a service bartender. You all helped he me had get a job, no, okay? It was because I was such a good worker and I spoke to the bartender and they thought I was such a good worker that they and thought Think of all the things I job. got for you. Think of all the opportunities I've gotten you. Yes, no, you're not gonna you're not gonna control yes, this yes, entire yes, conversation. I'm, I'm okay? Have I have gotten you that. I have gotten you many things. I'm, I'm I have, have told you I and, and if it wasn't for like my prodding you into doing example, things, you would simply lie around me and not even push your work. The fact that you have any, you've been in any shows have been because of my prodding. Because yes, you are, you I, are content. Marshall, yes, sure, let me tell you something. No. You're not the one that no, went you, to you work. you've got to give me a chance to talk. You're not going to monopolize this entire conversation. I think you're the one okay? that's going to monopolize it. No, you're not going to monopolize it, okay? Oh, I'm not going to speak you, at you, all. You would not have gotten no, into anything. You're going to gonna shut this thing up right now if I'm not going to get a chance to speak you, at all. You know, you are content to just lie around in your depression that and, and that hanging on your cross bullshit. and that feeling sorry for yourself. I'm the one who prodded you into action. Let me speak. Obviously, you're psychotic and that's tra being transferred into the camera. You have very psychotic behavior, okay? That, that is what's being transferred. And who's judging my psychotic behavior? Another psychotic? No, you are psychotic. Okay, you're a little woman, okay, but if you were a big man, you would be out murdering people on the street. Whenever he used to feel like getting his rocks off a little bit because he felt depressed with his own situation, he would say to me, you're nothing, you're a nobody, or you are as a waste. And wouldn't that prod you, you, you into action? I did that as a teacher, oh, to prod you into action. That was crazy. Every show, every, every yeah. action. Let Every me talk. Let me talk that, now, right? Like you're not, not going to monopolize this entire discussion, okay? Well, I'm going to have, have a chance to say something. You're not monopolizing this entire discussion. That was to prod you into action. Every, every, every exhibition, every show that you've ever been in, it's because I prodded you. This is a joke. This is a joke because you, you want to monopolize this entire discussion. That was to prod you into yeah. action, oh, sure. so okay? Because you were very, uh, you were very, very Thank content. You, Thank you for being so kind. Well, you're really miserable. You can't talk to this moron, you know? She's a moron, you know? She's an absolute total moron. And everybody in the audience can see this is a moron. 